for uh, to Seamus, introduce the panel, and uh, get us started. Thank you, Reynolds. Thank you, everybody, for being here on what is the Super Bowl, Christmas, Halloween, and birthday for legislative data in Congress. There it is. Everybody's alive, caffeinated, and well. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Reynolds, for putting this on. Uh, I really can't believe it. It grows every year. It gets better every year. And one of the coolest things that I see getting to come and join wonderful people like Kathy and Ethan uh, the last few years is that it's getting better, right? We're, we're no longer talking about how, but we're talking about whether and when. And that's progress. And the five hacks for Congress today, not to be confused with the five hacks in Congress, that's at a press conference somewhere upstairs. That's my one dad joke my team allowed me. Um, is to talk about how do we take that concept, this concept, in the room. This is a process of transformation and change that is making Congress better. Uh, but if you remember nothing else from today, it's that looking at Congress as a system that can be worked on in discrete systems of systems, just like this one, the legislative system, is the surest bet to success and perhaps the only way forward. Um, now, I'm the co-founder and executive director of the OpenGov Foundation. You can read all about us at opengovfoundation.org, so I'll spare you the background and the bio, because I want to get to the more interesting folks next to me. Um, before, I, uh, before I pass the mic to Kathy to tell you a little bit about who she is, uh, I would encourage everybody to go check out the absolutely one-of-a-kind research that the Congressional Management Foundation does. Uh, I first met them through that research. I remember it very distinctly, reading a, a report contacting Congress. Uh, why was it such an earth-shattering moment for me? Well, it quantified as best as I'd ever seen and to date have seen uh, how hard my job was as a congressional staffer. Uh, the avalanche of information flowing into us, I worked on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, um, was just mind-boggling and I, and I didn't know like anybody else cared. Not only does the Congressional Management Foundation care, but they know perhaps just as much as anybody in this room about just what is going on in this institution and for the five hacks for Congress, what are some of the cross-cutting opportunities uh, for people in this room and watching at home uh, who want to help build a better government uh, to take advantage of here on Capitol Hill? Kathy? Uh, I'm Kathy Goldschmidt. I'm uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives from the Congressional Management Foundation. And I came to the Hill uh, when email on the internet was just beginning to be widely used on Capitol Hill. And I started doing research and offering advice to offices about how and why to use um, these new technologies that seemed like they were going to catch on. Uh, I created the Gold Mouse Awards. I facilitated a process that led to um, some standards and an API for email advocacy campaigns that is now uh, in use in the House of Representatives. I co-led a project to develop a 10-year vision and plan for technology in the House of Representatives on which some of the legislative um, bulk data task force um, work is done, being done. Uh, and fast forward to 20 years, I am currently working on a project with uh, a bunch of House and Senate offices to begin to study and envision some transformations they're going to need to make in order to better meet the needs of information age members, staff, and constituents. And uh, Seamus just referenced um, email overload research we did uh, more than a decade ago and have been doing continually. We just finished a project last week um, and found that a lot of the same problems persist. So expect to see more about that. Uh, soon from SEMA. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Ethan Chumley comes at us from Microsoft's tech and civic engagement outfit. Um, John Sampson also comes from Microsoft here in the front row. Um, one of the things that I've been most surprised at over the last few years is getting to know a different uh, type of Microsoft outside of Word and Windows, um, and perhaps the most involved and supportive of our work in the larger open government and civic technology uh, world. You can't go to a city, you can't go to a conference, uh, without Microsoft there and willing to help. And uh, Ethan is one of those uh, supporters of all the activity that goes on over here. Ethan? Yeah, thanks, Seamus. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ethan Chumley, and, and as Seamus just said, I'm with Microsoft's Civic and Tech Engagement Branch. Uh, my, my day job right now uh, typically focuses on uh, political campaigns and elections and uh, helping them manage their big data and their tools and their analysis work. Uh, but also on the side, and, and when it's not an election season, uh, I'm helping uh, civic groups, civic organizations uh, sort of bridge that gap between these, the, the need that they have for tech tools outside of Word and Windows to, to really do some deep analysis, but also 
that sort of that, that valley and that some of these tools are complex and expensive and helping them navigate cheap tools, free tools, easy to use tools uh, to, to help them make better decisions uh, and, and be better civic leaders. Right on, thank you, Ethan. And Ethan will give us a great uh, look at and demo of what some of these hacks uh, could look like uh, with information and technology that exists today. Yep. The future is now. Um, so let's get started. On, uh, I, I turn to uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers to, to frame uh, the situation here. Uh, and I think it's something that the Bulk Legislative Data Task Force and everybody in this room has been working on in one of those systems, right, the legislative system, the legislative process. But we're seeing a, a 19th century institution often using 20th century technology to respond to 21st century problems. We need to change that. Um, I think she's describing exactly how this room has worked, but we have much more to do. The question of critical infrastructure uh, is the biggest one I think that's facing Congress. You know, technology has become, as uh, Travis Moore of the Tech Congress Fellowship likes to say, uh, technology has become the critical infrastructure of our personal lives uh, and our professional lives. Why hasn't it yet become the critical infrastructure of our civic lives? And we're sitting in the middle of the biggest civic space in the United States of America. Um, before I turn it over to Kathy to put a little bit of uh, data on the bones here, I wanted to, to frame the rest of our discussion uh, with two numbers and some real-time polling information made possible by bulk legislative data. Um, this morning I posted on uh, Cloakroom uh, a poll question asking uh, congressional staffers anonymously, do you agree or disagree? Information technology in Congress is as good or better than the private sector? Um, we got 36 uh, who did not agree, five did. So 88% said no, it could be better. So there is room for improvement. Uh, some of the quotes we got were, I'm about to put my fist through this decrepit computer, so I'm going with nay. <laughs> we still have a fax machine. And this is a joke, right? Of course not. Now it's not just people who work in the institution who clearly understand there's better ways to do a very important job. Um, but what about the constituents? Well, we're at a 16% approval rating right now. Pair those two numbers together, and that's a challenge, but I view that as an opportunity. A critical information or a critical infrastructure upgrade in this institution, I posit, stands to change those numbers and turn that tide better than anything else. Uh, and with that, Kathy? Um, so, as um we wanted to frame the problem, uh, Seamus addressed it. The critical infrastructure needs to be modernized. We all know that. Um, you also know uh, intuitively and by being staff um, that members and staff are getting crushed by the demands of the digital age and needs um, a lot of help. Um, this isn't an e easy place to work even for members. Um, the hours are long, pay is comparatively low. Um, the real-time scrutiny is brutal and um, unforgiving. And these are people, they're mostly well-meaning people, um, and given the environment, staff are turning over really quickly. And so a lot of the institutional knowledge and policy knowledge is going with them. So this is one of the challenges that we collectively face. Um, members and staff are experiencing serious information overload. They have data and information and um, advocacy coming at them 24 hours a day. Uh, and it's really hard to sift through all of that data. And I know some of the stuff that we're all doing with um, legislative bulk data is going to help some of that, but there are other ends and other parts of um, working in Congress and uh, representing citizens and constituents um, that aren't going to be addressed by that work. Um, and then despite a growing national population and rapidly changing society, Congress has cut its capacity. Um, since 1980, staffing in the House has actually declined. Since 1994, staffing in the Senate has been stagnant. Um, and House committee staffing is about half of what it was in 1980. So unsurprisingly, Congress is having some trouble turning public demand into satisfactory public policy. Um, and yeah, so Seamus changed the, um, made the, this is the crush. Um, the uh, constituent mail has increased through email and the internet um, dramatically. That 
is the, la the most, 2010 is the most recent data we have, and the downward slope from um, 2009 to 2010 was because um, the House and Senate got better spam filters. <laughs> um, and then money, staff, and know-how. Um, you know, with the capacity being what it is and technological um, knowledge within member offices um, and the turnover, staff don't have a chance to really explore what is available to them. And, um, you know, the ESRI data, um, you know, as soon as the staff, the staffer figures it out, they're gonna move on. Um, and the next staffer has to take the time to figure it out because there is no staff training. Um, so I'll turn it back to James. So what, so before we get to what we can do, what can't we do and why? Well, we can't scrap, scrap Congress and start all over again. Um, you know, it's not likely that Congress is going to increase its um, budget or its staffing anytime soon. As we all know, technology is the most promising option. Um, so we're the ones in the room that are going to help improve capacity and improve performance in Congress. Um, we need to collectively support a 21st century legislative branch that's capable of fill fulfilling its constitutional role. Um, Congress is not gonna change unless we're toying with a revolution or a constitutional convention, which I know some are out there, but <laughs> not in this room, I don't think. Um, and we have to understand and work with the system that we have. We can't increase the budget, that's a non-starter in this environment. We can't keep citizens from petitioning government for the redress of grievances, it's a constitutional right. Uh, and it's the lifeblood of the relationship between citizens and the people's branch. Um, we can't keep technology from marching forward. Members, staff, and citizens are going to continue to increase their expectations um, that Congress is gonna use technology effect effectively to do its job. Um, we're not going to change the fundamentals of the legislative process. We're going to develop technology to support it, but we absolutely cannot change it, no matter how much we want to. That requires an act of Congress. Can't diminish the role of Congress. Uh, it's the first branch. This is where citizens are represented, where government action is overseen, and where public policy is legislated. And of course, we cannot ignore the problem any longer, um, and we collectively are a big part of the solution. Amen. Um, and there's, there's another notion there that I'd like to add about just the, the federal separation of powers. And we've got some incredible stuff happening at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. You're all probably familiar with the US Digital Service, 18F, the new technology transformation agency coming online. They paid us a visit up here uh, for an oversight uh, committee, IT subcommittee hearing that was just groundbreaking. It didn't make the news because it went as, as it should. Um, but that's improving executive branch ability to execute and frankly spend taxpayer dollars. Um, what does it do to the integrity of our federal system when that's happening at a far greater pace perhaps than what is happening in the judicial branch or the legislative branch? Um, you know, that is a challenge I think one could hang the hat on no matter how tech savvy or not a member is or a member of the press is. That's something I think everybody can understand. Um, and that's the framework we're working in here. Um, but what can we do? So within that constrained framework, thank you for, for taking the sad face <laughs> part of the proceedings, um, we can look at Congress as a system of systems. Um, this is something that Reynolds, uh, a thought process Reynolds has developed and I know a lot in this room have contributed to. If you look, if you break Congress down by constituent services, lawmaking, procurement and oversight or something like that, then you can start to get at problems. You're no longer looking at a monolithic broken thing that only, what, 16% of Americans feel great about. You're looking at it like manageable projects we can bite off and chew. And some of that can be done in an open source fashion. Some of it can be done by government vendors. Some of it can be done by people in this room. Um, but that's a sea change, I think, in how we look at Congress as a functioning 21st century outfit. Um, it is not just a thing. It is many little things, which is an important step. Um, so looking at a lot of the work that CMF has done, which is uh, what makes it so valuable, I think, to the whole world and the whole space, is it's not just looking at, is there a better piece of software, right? Does the way we write constituent mail, uh, can that be better? It can that be improved, but how can the actual use of said platform to fulfill Congress's critical constitutional obligations be improved? And a lot of the research that Kathy's done, and she 
undersold how wonderful it is. Some of the work that's coming together now and completing um, will be transformational in an even bigger way. Um, but one of the, the cross-cutting issues that we talk about is engagement. Like what, it, what is engagement to you, to CMF, and what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see? Well, engagement is the relationship, of course, between citizens or constituents and the senators and representatives that represent them. Um, and there are a lot of efforts out there external to Congress to get citizens more engaged um, in the work of Congress. And uh, the, both in the commercial space, in the nonprofit space, um, a lot of activity out there. But a lot of it doesn't take Congress into account. And um, so engaging citizens um, when Congress doesn't have the capacity to engage back um, is a challenge. And a challenge that I think um, is, is ripe for addressing. Um, and the killer app hasn't been identified yet. Um, not even close. If there is a killer app, um, it's going to deliver informed opinion that's representative of a member's constituents. It's going to reduce the quantity and increase the quality of the messages. It's going to save staff time and better facilitate the relationship between members and their constituents. It's going to acknowledge the role that corporations, nonprofits, and advocacy groups play in the um, democratic process. They do have a role. Um, and the challenge here is going to be to develop a system that acknowledges the actual roles and workflows of constituent members, staff, and interest group, groups in the public policy making process, um, and not the workflows and roles that we wish they played. Uh, we're never going to be a direct democracy, or not anytime soon. Um, and so we have to develop tools that facilitate representative democracy. Is this the biggest pain point you come across when you talk to offices? Yes, it's absolutely the biggest pain point. Um, and because it takes up to half of a house office's time responding to constituent communications. And that's time that they're not spending on legislating um, or representing constituents in other ways. Um, according to our most recent data, which isn't very recent, um, the constituents who send messages to Congress represent maybe 10% of a district. So you figure the average is um, 700,000 people. That's a lot of people that they're not hearing from and a lot of resources being used for a small percentage. Um, and I'm not saying these communications are valueless or unimportant. I'm saying that we can find better ways for that communication to happen. Just to hang some, some numbers on that, we did a focus group, or a couple focus groups uh, last year with uh, congressional chiefs of staff, uh, communications directors, and legislative directors, and uh, this is a direct quote from one of them. Um, I think a better tool for constituent engagement is absolutely essential, but I also think the bigger problem is the strategy of advocacy in this race to the bottom. And so we went from 29,000 emails, receiving 29,000 emails in 2012, to 54,000 in 2013. And that does not even include emails from Move On, Credo, and other, other advocacy organizations like that. I mean, that's an that's a unbelievable technology opportunity, but unless we address it, you can't really expect folks to work on other things. Um, collaboration, our next cross-cutting issue. What is collaboration? Well, everything in Congress depends on collaboration and relationship. Everything. Um, you all know that. Um, so far, there's not a lot out there that actually aligns to the work and the workflows of congressional staff and members. So there's the, the legislative document collaboration tools being developed, but there's pieces on the other ends um, from you know, the constituent meeting where an idea for a piece of legislation is developed um, or you know, the great idea happens to the stage where the offices, sorry, the committees are keeping tabs on the um, programs that were implemented in order to um, uh, enact the legislation that was passed. Um, email, Dropbox, constituent more, uh, correspondence management systems aren't going to do the trick. They're, they're not right now. Um, so the killer app for collaboration in Congress is going to connect the workflows from beginning to end um, and 
Uh, it's gonna make it easy and intuitive to share and not share information, both inside and outside Congress. Uh, it's gonna make it quick and easy for members and managers to do kind of a 50,000 foot view of what's going on with different projects, different legislation um, and initiatives. It's going to be secure. Uh, and the challenge here is gonna be to create or identify something that is secure, robust, and easy to use that's also affordable to Congress um, and which exists in a civic space versus a commercial space. Um, so there's some trickiness with the speech or debate clause about where congressional data lies. And um, there's also, as Seamus alluded to, the capacity of Congress and um, maintaining its uh, authority with respect to the executive branch and the, ju the judicial branch, um, as well as with respect to um, all of the interests out there. Um, it's going to need to have its own tools, its own knowledge. Um, it has to exist in a civic space. Do we not have a really wonderful example that came out of people in this room about working together in a unified workflow and effectively, efficiently sharing data from organization and organization office to office? The full data uh, task force? Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. That, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> I want to make sure yes, we have indeed. enough time. I want to make sure we have enough time to show what some of these hacks look like, but I wanted to, to highlight something Kathy said. Um, the, the change in mindset is way more important than a change in software or data. Um, better is better. It doesn't have to be best. Um, it doesn't, although it sometimes pains to say me, it doesn't have to be open source. It doesn't have to be pumping out open data if it is better and if we're on that road. Um, that's, a, that's a slightly different view of the challenge and of how we solve it forward, but better is better. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here. So with that, Ethan, what does a better way to dive through some of this information look like and analyze it? Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so what I wanna talk to you guys about right now is a better, a better way to maybe look at some of this data and to, as Kathy said, you're swimming in data. And everyone here, I think, is swimming in data, whether or not they realize it, constituent communications or uh, the bulk legislative data, and by, I'm gonna do this. By a show of hands, who in the room is a data scientist? One, two, right. If your hand's up, this may not be for you. <laughs> Everybody else, the other 98% of the room, this is for you, right? Just because you're not a data scientist doesn't mean you don't deal with data every day and you're not swimming in it every day, right? And I, I think of data as something that's lying around, a, a latent asset. And if you can take that, almost like a raw material that you, is around you, then you may not notice it. Uh, if you can take that raw material and do something with it, even just a little bit, if you can just shine it a little, it may not be perfect, it may not be a beautiful gold ring, uh, but it's something you can get insight from, and it's something you can start to take action on. Uh, it's something you can use to stop responding to events and identify trends before they occur and start leading and getting ahead of news cycles and getting ahead of events. Um, so what I'd like to do real quick is, is just show off a few tools. Um, uh, Ryan, if we can switch and show my laptop here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this off by saying that everything I'm about to show you is free. Everything that I'm about to show you is openly available and completely open to you to use now, today. You could walk out of here and use these things. And we're gonna start in everyone's favorite data tool, Excel. Um, speaking of non-data non scientists in the room, if you're responsible for congressional correspondence, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, constituent correspondence, and you're answering the phones and you're processing letters and all day, you may just be responding and throwing it off. Well. What if you started to, to take some of that data and, and look at it, right? Record when people were calling, what the topic they were calling about is, uh, the notes that, that, you know, about the call. You might end up with a sheet that looks like this. That's really boring. That's really not uninteresting to look at and doesn't really help anyone. So you can take the smallest bit of tools like pivot tables and Excel and simple charts uh, and you can say, what are people calling about? What do they care about? Why, why are they contacting me and what are the issues that are key to them? We see here, this giant yellow slice represents education. Apologies for the broad categories, this is all just data that I made up, but, uh, <laughs> right? So you can get basic insights, and your job, all of a sudden, you elevate yourself above somebody that just answers phones to maybe someone that 
gains insight into what their constituents are thinking about, and you can raise issue to your bosses about why people are calling before they happen. Um, in Excel, which everyone has and is familiar with, who's ever seen this 3D map button at the top? It's there. Yeah, it's cool. Um, you can map things really quickly, right? You saw that I was collecting zip code. You may not have seen. I was collecting zip code in that spreadsheet that I just showed. And, you know, maybe we want to look at this data, right? We saw some amazing examples from Esri from uh, CRS earlier, and those are really great um, sort of executive level publishable graphics, and, and, and this is not meant to outdo or overshine that. But maybe you just want insight in your office, and you don't have three weeks to wait. Right? You can put something like this together in quite literally 10 seconds. Um, let's you see you know, what, what areas in, in, my, in my territory do people care about. Maybe I want to see what they care about. Uh, and we can go through this color map here and see. Right? These are really quick things that you can use to make better data, to make data better available to you to make better insights. Um, as Seamus was saying earlier, there's this huge movement around open data uh, and, and or agencies publishing their data. Uh, that's not a secret. It's not kept in a vault somewhere, right? You can go out and get it. Go to data.gov, and right now, not right now. Uh, you can go to data.gov, and you can see this data. You can search by data sets. You can download uh, anything you want. Let's look at data about community development grants. Maybe there's some legislation that you want, that you're working on, your office is working on. You want to you look into that. Uh, and we have maybe some community development block grants in New York State. Great, we can download that data set. One of those new tools that he was talking about, and I, I, I'm going to be very careful to position this not as the app that solves the data problem, but an app that lets non-data scientists really quickly make analysis and analyze data that then maybe you can turn into insight, right? Cultivating that data through a tool called Power BI, if anyone's interested, powerbi.com. Uh, it's free. You can download it. It runs on your desktop. You can publish to web. You can keep to yourself. You can share on the web, wh uh, whatever you'd like. Uh, you can pull data in. Uh, Kathy was saying that there is a, you know, it, it's a little ambiguous who owns data and where it's stored. Uh, it, you know, is it open data sets that are on the, online or are they secure databases on your network, right? Connect to one of those. Connect to local files, databases. Connect to pull in your Facebook analytics from your favorite congressman. See what's going on there. Uh, see what the world thinks about them. Merge these data sources together to, to start to gain better insight. Right? So we're going to take um, those community development block grants that we just got and, and bring them in here. Uh, I, as that comes up here, we're, we're going to take this tool and uh, time me. If someone would like to start a stopwatch in the next 60 seconds, we're going to make a really interesting infographic here that might tell you something that you didn't know out of a really boring data set that is completely out there for everyone to use. Right? If we wanted to look at county in New York State go. and... Hmm? I said go. Oh, you said go. <laughs> Great. Uh, where is money being spent in New York State by county? Here we go. The size of the bubble represents the county where money is being spent. Okay, that's kind of cool, but what if I want to look at it by the project year um, where my congressman was in office? Okay, so now we can maybe filter this down by year, and uh, how many projects are open versus closed? That would be, would be an interesting thing to know. So let's create something like that here. Uh, open versus closed projects, and though data may be boring, sometimes it's interesting to see what projects are pulling in the most money. I'm just clicking on things here, I'm just clicking on the, the headings of the data, and I'm getting really interesting graphics. Done, how's my time? With a robust 12 seconds to spare. There Give this man a round of applause. Thank you. Real-time data exploration up here. Right. Data exploration, right? And now you can start to dive into this data, and you can see is you could think how if you had population data and you were to overlay it on top of this. Are my community development grants going where people live? Are they going where people don't live? Is that the point, right? Is the, the information on, uh, that you get out of data analysis is not to tell you what is happening. It tells you what is happening, but not why, right? It doesn't tell you that you're making good policy decisions or not. It simply tells you what is happening, and having insight into what is happening in the world, in your district, in your area, can help make a world of difference in creating legislation, in uh, supporting or fighting legislation, uh, in, in helping make new decisions, and helping to drive press headlines, and again, to lead. 
and not to just follow and not to just react, to identify trends before they happen, right? I, I think that uh, all of the non-data scientists in the room can probably agree that if they took, what, what was it, uh, 48 seconds to put something like this together, uh, it probably a little more, gives you more insight and does not take the time and does not take the money that uh, some, of, some more professional and in-depth tools take. Um, and, and I guess if, if, we, if we move on to that, if we move on from this and start expanding, and what happens if you took more than 48 seconds to put something together? What if you, you know, really started diving into, if you wanted to better understand the demographics of your district? We're gonna take uh, Representative Dold here in the Illinois 10th. Uh, what if we started to look at, you know, the demographic data in his, in, in, in his region, right? Estimates by, by race, by uh, civilian and veteran status, disability status. But it, it should be no surprise here, or it should be no surprise to the, the, uh, uh, those that work in his office that this, this is sort of an upper middle class district. So be it, they probably know that, but with numbers like this, you can really quantify that. And if you're trying to work, work across district to support legislation or to work across the country, uh, getting this insight is key. And then what you choose to do with it is up to you. Um, you know, what if industry and jobs, right? Management, business, science, huge, huge portion of this district. Of course you probably knew that, but uh, you know, now, now if a staffer could put some quantifiable metrics around that, uh, that, that could improve their experience to advise and, and make them better employees. I'm gonna just show one more example here of pulling another publicly available data set, right? I got this from, from data.gov as well. This is Chicago 311 metrics. Why are people, back to that initial example, why are people calling your office? If they're calling your office, they're probably really frustrated before they, well, perhaps not. But before they call you, they're probably also calling 311 to try to fix the problem locally as well. Uh, so uh, this is sort of a, a, a silly example, but rodent abatement requests in Chicago. I'm gonna move on past that. Uh, and you can just pull in these really nice charts and bars and you can set metrics and you can say, you know, I understand that graffiti is going to happen and I'm okay with uh, whatever this is, 10,000 graffiti requests uh, for removal per year. That's fine, but once we get over that, we have a problem and who can I call in the mayor's office and who can I contact? Making these simple, easy to read dashboards very quickly uh, is again what all of this data insight is about. Uh, and, and one of the coolest features that I just wanna show off here in, in Power BI is what if you're really not a data scientist but you're really good at talking, um, which uh, a lot of people are. Uh, so we're gonna ask for the count of potholes removed, or sorry, reported uh, by month in 2012. Okay, maybe, there we go like that, if you can ask a question of your data, if you can formulate a sentence, you can see that. Maybe your boss likes column charts, so as a column chart. Okay. These really simple tools that can give us insight, right? This isn't an app that's gonna tell you how to fix potholes, but man, it sure lets you know that in early spring, you get a lot of pothole requests. And then you can take action, you can do something with that data. Um, so, you know, with, with that, I, I sort of close and turn it back over to these guys with, we all have access to the same data, right? It's not, a, it's not, it's no longer a question of, do I have access to data, can I get it? It's out there. We all have access to the same ones, and whether or not you choose to use it is your choice. Whether or not you choose to cultivate that asset and turn it into insights is your choice. Um, and, and by doing so, you can really, you know, both personally elevate yourself and your abilities and elevate what you're doing on a day-to-day -day above your job title, um, but more importantly, as an entire organization, you can elevate an institution to respond to needs better. So, wow. that's sort of my pet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what, what can somebody whose neurons are now firing uh, <laughs> and works in a congressional environment do to learn more? Uh, so, if you wanna learn more particularly about this tool, uh, powerbi.com, I'll say it again, powerbi.com. Um, and then at the end, also, you know, feel free to come up and talk to me, talk to John here in the front row. We can uh, certainly provide you with more information. We can, uh, you know, set up trainings if that's really what, what will make the difference. But uh, th there's lots of, lots of information on open data on, on data.gov and a hundred other websites as well that I don't have time to dive into. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, 
powerbi.com, data.gov, do some quick uh, Google searches, do some Bing searches as well if you choose. And uh, you know, talk, talk to me, talk to any of us on the stage. Thank you, Ethan. Yeah, of course. Now we have seven minutes left, so I wanna make sure that we are not the ones standing between you and sustenance. <laughs> um, but that's a perfect segue. Kathy, do you see anybody in congressional offices using tools like this? Uh, some, and they were on the dais <laughs> a little while ago. Um, and some other offices are using them, but uh, not many. And I think one of the things in that we in this room can do is to get the word out about these simple tools, which I think can also be, um, you can probably use Power BI, you can import your um, constituent database yep. into the tool and use this to manage and look at your, your constituent database in, in different ways. Um, but yeah, the, one of the problems that we were uh, talking about is the capacity to access and understand data is a, a big problem. Um, particularly in member offices, but also to a certain degree in some committee offices. Um, and yeah, if we could help them realize that they have these tools at their fingertips for free, integrated into tools they're already using and understand how to use and are comfortable with, um, I think that would go a long way. Cool, so we have two more quick, we'll do quick ones and we'll end on a very <laughs> high note. Um, so the internal oversight of this institution is, is something that found its way into the news uh, recently or f a few months ago, the member of Congress uh, getting uh, improperly reimbursed for spending out of his uh, MRA. Um, okay, that's, that's an important thing. Like we should know how Congress is spending our taxpayer money, um, but the systems that have existed to provide that transparency and provide that internal management ability um, have needed a lot of work. But one of the more exciting things, and this is, file this under the better, if not best, um, is there is or will soon be an upgrade to how MRA spending is not only accounted for internally, but it's reported out. Um, actually, there is a sign of progress I want everybody to celebrate here. Um, we were able to go get House and Senate spending data um, in a CSV format directly from the source. Um, that's an incredible improvement over thousand, hundreds if not thousands of pages of PDF documents that the Sunlight Foundation helpfully scraped into a CSV file, that's progress. Um, but all of that adds up to the last hack. And the last hack is trust and confidence in the institution. Um, ultimately, that's the world we try to play in and the bridge we at the Open Gov Foundation uh, try to help buttress and build, uh, which is for an institution as important as Congress. It is Article One. you know, we are number one. Um, for it to fulfill its incredibly important obligations in the 21st century, at some point, we need to turn around that 16% approval rating. Um, if the public does not have trust and confidence in the institution, it doesn't have trust and confidence in the ability of the institution to solve the problems that we're all facing. I don't need to give you the litany of challenges we are facing in the 21st century, but they're big and only growing. Um, however, what we've done here and what we've witnessed this morning is a grade A example of how you rebuild trust and confidence in this institution with technology. A rock solid, open, uh, efficient legislating system where you can get notifications and alerts and you can actually know what your member of Congress is doing from your mobile phone is an enormous tr truth and trust buttressing operation and accomplishment. And it's one that everybody in this room should celebrate. Um, but we do have a long way to go and I wanna close, throw it to Kathy for some closing words on what's next with her research and how can everybody find it and get involved with what you're doing. Um, so our uh, website is congressfoundation.org and um, our organization is, has been around for 40 years and we exist to serve congressional staff um, and we do research and provide training and services to help congressional staff um, and to help the institution and the operations of Congress run better, more effectively, um, and in ways that work for members and staff. Um, and I wanna thank you all for being here. This is really important, and, and um, we may have sounded a little um, down, <laughs> we, but this is hopeful. Um, we wanted to present some problems that we in this room uh, haven't necessarily been focused on that 
CMF and OpenGov have identified as being significant problems for individual congressional offices and the staff and members um, who comprise them. So we've got our work cut out for us, but we're laying a really great framework and foundation. And if anybody can do it, it's the fine men and women sitting right in front of us here. So thank you guys for the work that you're doing. And you get to go to lunch two whole minutes earlier. You're welcome. This panel is now adjourned. <laughs> well, thank, thank you all for uh, laying out some uh, challenges we need to keep working on. Lunch is from now until 1.10. I guess we're using the odd minutes there to keep you awake on your uh, calendar. <laughs> the, uh, the first panel after lunch is a really interesting group of, uh, of thought leaders to talk about uh, the unfinished work uh, from another dimension. Uh, we've come a long way, but what else needs to be done? So I encourage you to be back for that. If you are into souvenirs, I have to point out that the Law Librarian of Congress's table out back as an official gavel pencil, which you really can't live without. So with that, hope to see you at uh, 110.